technology moves so fast these days, doesn't it? It wasn't like that when I was growing up, I'm quite sure. In my first decade of life, the only technology development that I saw was a television going from black and white to colour. That was it. No more. In my second decade, I saw a computer, just the one. Teacher rolled it in on a trolley in the classroom with great aplomb. We were so impressed. We had no idea how much that was going to change our lives. In my third decade, I saw a digital camera. And in my fourth, my mother gave me one of those newfangled mobile phones. It was roughly the size of a house brick and almost as heavy. <laughs> but in my fifth decade, all of these technologies underwent rapid advancement and merged into a single device that fitted into the palm of my hand. And with that came huge opportunities for health autonomy and significant improvements to my quality of life. I could take a photo of a skin spot and send it off for analysis without having to wait weeks for a specialist. I can prepare meals for special diets and then burn them <laughs> like a boss. <laughs> I can monitor my mood and maintain my well-being. I can view videos of correct exercise, stretching exercise, even yoga techniques if I was so inclined. I'm connected at a level that's previously unparalleled. And as a scientist working in this space, it's like technology has wings while research just walks. And development flies so fast that we don't know what effect these technologies are having, if any, on our brains and particularly on developing brains. We didn't know what effect television was going to have on our brains. There was furor when computer games came out and how they were going to affect developing brains. Even Plato talked about how books were going to affect our brains. But we have developed the capacity to acquire knowledge from the written word. And the biggest risk prediction from television was the sedentary behaviour of sitting in front of it not from any deficits to neural processing. And that's because brains are adaptable. And the reason they're adaptable is because of their connectivity. The very first thing a baby brain cell does is put out a process to talk to other cells. How cute are they? <laughs> and it's the maturation of these cells and the relative plasticity of their connections that underpins everything that we do. And this is true throughout life. At the Queensland Brain Institute, we're looking at the effect of adult vitamin D deficiency on learning and memory in mice and in humans. This is a coronal section, so cut straight through here, of a mouse brain showing the hippocampus, which is the region of the brain responsible for learning and memory. In older humans with mild cognitive impairment, those who have inadequate levels of vitamin D have poorer performance on memory tests. And when we look at their brain scans, we see that they have reduced connectivity from the hippocampus to other areas of the brain. We need connectivity to function. Now, at this point, I need to digress because I have a beautiful boy child and he told me that I cannot tell you about brain dysfunction without giving you some tips on how to keep it healthy. So it's as simple as exercising your six senses, and it's best done while you're walking around because you're pumping around, your blood's pumping um, oxygen, saturating those neural circuits. And this is what I want you to do. I want you to think, what can you see? How many shades of green? What's the furthest point you can see? What can you hear? What can you smell? Are you near the bakery? And what memories do those smells evoke? Coffee always reminds me of sneaky lattes with my brother on the rare occasions that our schedules align. Stolen moments. What can you taste? What does the wind feel like against your face? Is it different against your clothes? And can you feel your feet connecting with the earth? And if you can't, ditch rubber soles for a while. Go barefoot for a bit. And something that we've always known, but have only just recognised as a sense, what do you feel in your gut? 
the vagus nerve, is a superhighway to the thalamus, which is a relay station of the brain. All your senses, except smell, enter the thalamus and are disseminated out to other areas of the brain. And it's these connections and exercising this connectivity that keeps our brains healthy and protects us against cellular vulnerability. And as it is within, so it is without. A connected health system allows us to empower our most vulnerable members of our community. At CSIRO, we did some work with some residents in a um, residential care aged care service. They had some really funky ways of staying connected. Uh, one of them, she had a set of curtains that she used to open in the morning to let her neighbour know that she was up and about for the day. She's my favourite. We're not allowed favourites. She's my favourite. Her name was Mrs L. Incredible woman. She was um, intelligent, independent, organised, a bit of a loner. We wanted to connect these residents with remote family, and with the health system so that they could live independently for longer. So we outfitted their houses with a suite of unobtrusive sensors designed to detect activities of daily living like meal preparation, attention to hygiene, movement around the house, that sort of thing. All the data was collected and sent back to them on a tablet device and they had the option to send it to approved family members and practitioners through web portals. Now, it was early days, we were just testing the sensors. We didn't have a response system set up with it. And one night, Mrs L had a stroke. When those curtains remained closed two days running, the neighbour alerted the facility staff, and Mrs L was found still in a bed. She later died in hospital without ever regaining consciousness. I couldn't stop thinking about her. I had to know if that was a commercial product, if we'd had a response service, could those sensors have saved a life? Now, had we been monitoring in real time, there is no doubt in my mind that Mrs L would have been found before she was. We would have known her normal rising time and whether or not she was prone to spending days in bed. When that wasn't the case, an alert would have been sent out early on that first day my question is, would that have been beneficial? She didn't leave her room after the stroke. She didn't hit the panic button, even though it was right beside the bed. That suggests that the stroke was quite debilitating and that even if we'd managed to find her within that two-hour window that we know is so critical with stroke, she still may have required ongoing care for the rest of her life. Mrs L was fiercely independent. I asked her once, do your family call you once a week? And she said, I raised my children to be independent. If they're calling me once a week, I didn't do it right. <laughs> <laughs> they're not the words of a woman who would take kindly to being bathed and fed. So if we're going to save Mrs L's life, we needed to save her quality of life. And to do that, we needed to detect the stroke before, not after the event. So I looked back to see what secrets the sensors held, and I found there was a 10-day window prior to the stroke during which Mrs L's habits around the house changed drastically. So from the motion sensors alone, we could see that um, activity right around the house, with the exception of the bedroom, was significantly reduced. This is the number of sensor fires, significantly reduced. In the kitchen, they were reduced by 60%. And when I had a look at the other sensors in the kitchen that told us about meal preparation, I could see that that was decreasing over that 10-day period as well, with next to no meals prepared in the last three days. Bathroom use was also decreasing over the same time period, and again, no use in the last three days. The toilet was in the bathroom. Mrs L's health data showed that, showed that she had a low body temperature, fairly typical for older people, but also associated with stroke severity. She had high blood pressure, 
She had fluctuating blood pressure. She had a low pulse rate. She had polycythemia, which is a high red blood cell count, all of which are associated with increased risk of stroke. She was spending more time in the bedroom, indicative of fatigue, and she was losing weight. Now, on their own, none of those factors are of great concern, but together, they're nothing short of alarming. This is the power of a connected health system. The sensors were all there, the sensors all worked, the data was all there. What was missing was the connection of these predictors to a specialist through a response service. And for Mrs L, we would have alerted every specialist in town if our system had been connected. Connected Health is all about quality of life. We work with Western Health. We developed this app. This is cool tech, simple tech. This is an app that translates key hospital phrases into 10 different languages so that clinicians can assess non-English speaking patients in the absence of an interpreter. Now, our intention was just to facilitate clinician-patient communication uh, so that we could improve provision of timely care. But it had a ripple effect. The nurses got wind of it, and they said, hey, what about us? We have to attend to these patients every day. We can't call an interpreter in to help them find their glasses. So we built in a whole lot of phrases and images that allowed the nurse to know what a non-English speaking patient was after when they pressed the buzzer, or explain to them that they were just taking them down to x-ray or about to perform a routine procedure. But do you know what the biggest impact of that tech was? It was on peace of mind for the patients and their families. These people were frightened and confused. They can't understand anything the staff are telling them, and the staff can't understand them. The app demonstrated acceptance of diversity, compassion for concepts beyond immediate care. They felt integral to their treatment plan and included in the wards. They were connected. And the humanity of that simple technology had the power to change the trajectory of their recovery. I believe the right tech can change the course of people's lives as well. We do some really rewarding work with the wider autism community. Fabulous stuff. We, um, it's seriously cool tech. It's chatbots and robots, like this dude. And it's heaps of fun. So we have now this robot, and we put him into a disability unit working with kids who were minimally verbal or non-verbal. And one of the things that they can do as part of that program is that they can give him commands. And there was this one little boy who really wanted to command now to dance, but now is a French robot, and he doesn't suffer accents. So you have to articulate really, really clearly to get him to cooperate. Well, this little boy, he tried and he tried and now just sat there. So he went home and he practised and he practised and he practised. His parents had never heard him so verbal. He came in the next day and he asked now to dance. And dance he did. That little boy now verbally participates in all his classes and at home. And that has the potential to completely change his whole world. And all because of a funny little dancing dude and a roboticist with a big heart. People say that we don't have a health system, we have a disease system, because we only get seen when something's wrong, when things aren't going right. Connected health can take us beyond this model by connecting us with practitioners, with each other, with healthier versions of ourselves. We can empower parents and carers by providing them with the resources to confidently care for their charges. But our platforms need to be built with compassion. We need to tailor our tech with humanity and we need to use our data to make a difference. One of the ways we do this at CSIRO is by working with the people who need the tech or are going to use the tech. 
Our elderly residents, they helped design the user interface for that tablet. Seriously. <laughs> Big buttons, they said. No fine print. <laughs> <laughs> Young kids on the spectrum program our chatbots. Man, they're cluey. Never underestimate neurodiversity. Those guys are amazing to work with. We're building tech with the community, for the community. And that ensures the most important thing, that our hearts are connected. And not just for the most vulnerable people in our community, but for all of us. Connected health puts health autonomy right into the palm of our hands. Thank you. Thank you.